Okay. So that's actually really it for the hashing. Okay, all the stuff we want to say about hash functions in particular, that's it. But uh, there are some odds and ends here at the end of this chapter, um, some little special topics kinds of things that really don't sort of fit in anywhere else. Uh, and there's several of them, but none that we're going to say. We're going to talk about each, but not for any great length of time. Okay, secret sharing. Uh, this is kind of an interesting idea. We'll uh, tell you what it's good for at the end here, but just hold on and get the idea here. It's, it's a very simple concept, but yet uh, pretty uh, powerful. So uh, it can really be described, at least in this context here, as two points determine a line. <laughs> what could be simpler? Okay, so the idea is this. Uh, we want to have Alice and Bob share a secret in this sense. They share Together, they can determine the secret, but individually, each of them knows nothing about the secret. Okay, that's the goal here. Okay, so here's what we could do. We could make the secret, this point uh, S here, whatever it crosses the, uh, the uh, Y axis, and we could create a line that goes through that particular point S, okay, and then just pick two points, just randomly select two points on that line, give one of those points to Bob and one of those points to Alice. Okay, now together, they can use those two points, write the equation of the line, plug in x equals zero, and they'll know what y is. Okay, and they both get the solution, they get the secret. Okay, but individually. Okay, so if you're Alice here, do you, with your, just your point, what do you know about the secret value s? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Okay, and why is that? Because there's an infinite number of lines that go through that point, any slope. You can get any point on the y-axis by choosing the appropriate lines. You know absolutely nothing. There's not even an exhaustive search you can do here, right? Okay, there's nothing. You have no information about that point S. But when two people get together, when you get together with Bob, you can determine it easily, okay, just trivially. Well, okay, can we, can we uh, do something maybe a little more general? Can we have like a system where any two out of three people need to get together to determine the secret? I had another point. It's going to be easier. Okay, so here's Alice, here's Bob, here's Charlie. Give him a point right here. Now, any one person still can't determine anything about the secret S, but any two of the three can get together and determine the secret S. Okay? That's good. We can do. Two out of anything, two out of three, two out of four, two out of five, just have a single line and give points on that line. How about three out of something? Can we do three out of three, three out of four? How might we do that? Uh, it's not quite that complicated. Well, parabola. Parabola, just a higher level, a higher level polynomials, right? Higher degree polynomials. Oh, and there's the three out of three, or two out of three thing we just said. Okay, here's three out of three, right? Because three points determine a second degree polynomial. It's a function, so it only goes through the x axis, you know, y axis once. Uh, and so that point, again, is the uh, secret. Here we need all three. Any two just determines a line, doesn't tell us anything about where the other point is, okay? So two doesn't help, it takes all three. How about three out of four? Can we do three out of four? How would we do that? Add another point. <laughs> Just put another point on there. Again, any three can determine, but fewer than three cannot. Okay, any three or more. Okay, so this is easy, right? Okay, it's easy to uh, construct such uh, systems. What's the use? Well, okay, here's an example uh, from uh, uh, almost 20 years ago. In the early 90s, uh, the Clinton administration had this idea. They were going to require key escrow. Okay, what that means is, for at least certain applications, you could encrypt your data. Okay, it was just becoming very popular at that time to encrypt your data. You know, whatever sort of data. Um, but you have to register your keys. Okay, you basically have to give somebody your key. <laughs> and what's the thinking here? The thinking is, uh, you know. If we get a court order, we should be able to go and decrypt this 
uh, information. Okay, so we would go to the court, we'd go to appropriate agencies, we would get the key, we could decrypt the information. All right. Um, need, uh, needless to say, this wasn't too popular. Never really caught on. Okay, didn't go anywhere or anything like that. But if you were to construct such a system, you could uh, make it maybe a little bit more palatable by taking the key, okay, taking your key, instead of giving it to one agency, you would give, you know, use this secret sharing scheme, and you would give it so that, you know, two or, say, two or more agencies had to get together to uh, uh, agree uh, to recover your key. So, for example, you might um, not trust the FBI too much, but you say, okay, it's not so bad if, you know, at least two of these three government agencies have to get together to recover my key. I would maybe be more willing to do it. So you put your key, and your key would be this point here. You could construct a line through there. You just pick three points on that line and give those three points to these uh, various government agencies. Uh, so no one can get your key, but two or more can. Okay, maybe this still sounds a little far-fetched than anybody would ever do this, but think about it. Um, maybe at a corporate level, okay, if you work for a corporation, you have a key, you encrypt the data on your hard drive, right, because when you're out traveling, you know, if somebody steals your computer, they don't want your data to get stolen, right, it's important proprietary company information. They may want the key, right, and legitimately, because if you forget the key or you forget your password to access the key or whatever, they want to be able to recover that data, it's important information. Okay, so how are they going to store these keys? Well, that's easy. Just give them to the system administrator, right? Well, okay, now the system administrator has access to all these keys and is a pretty powerful person. If they go nuts, they can steal all the information and you know, do a lot of damage to your company. You could conceivably split those keys amongst multiple system administrators so they would at least have to cooperate in order to steal this information, right? Okay, so, <laughs> it's an interesting concept. Um, okay, here's another uh, thing that's actually pretty closely related to the secret sharing, kind of has a bigger wow factor, so I kind of like this. It's kind of a fun thing to do. I think you'll like the homework problem you do in this uh, visual cryptography. Okay, so it's a form of secret sharing. So what we want to do is we want to create a situation where Alice and Bob can share an image in the sense that each of them gets a, an image file, but it just looks like random bits, okay? Until they put their images together, then they can recover the original image. They can see what the original image was. But individually, they don't know anything about the image itself, okay? So is this possible? Well, of course, or we wouldn't be talking about it, right? Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll think about doing this at the level of a pixel. So how can we share a pixel, and we'll assume it's a black and white uh, image. So how can we share a pixel so that Alice and Bob can combine their information and recover the original pixel, but individually they know nothing about the original pixel, okay? If we can do it for one pixel, we can do it for an entire image, okay? Okay, so the idea is this. It's, black, it's a black and white photo. So look at the original pixel. If it's white, flip a coin, choose between these two options here, A or B. <coughs> if you get A, make Alice's pixel look like this and Bob's look like this. If you get B, that goes to Alice and that goes to Bob. On the other hand, if the original pixel is black, flip a coin, choose between C and D. If you choose, uh, if you get head, there's Alice and there's Bob's pixel. If you get uh, tails, there's that goes to Alice and that goes to Bob. Do that for every pixel in the original image. Okay, now you've got two separate images. If you overlay those two images, what's going to happen? If the original pixel was white, what do we get? We either get this guy or this guy, okay? Which is not exactly white, it's half white, half black. On the other hand, if we get, if the original pixel was black, we either have these two guys or these two guys, and when we overlay those, we do get black. So what happens to the image? What does the image look like? Yeah, okay, basically it turns a black and white image into a black and gray image. Okay, these things will look gray, and these things will look black, but you can still tell what the image is. 
All right. What about Alice and Bob? What do they uh, What do they get to see? Right. <laughs> Lots of great. <laughs> That's great. Uh, but they get to see. I mean, think of it from Alice's perspective. You look at a pixel. It either looks like this or this. If it looks like this. What does it tell you about the original pixel? Tells you it was white or black. Well, that's pretty useful information. Okay. What if the pixel looks like this? Same. It was either white or black. You have no way to know whether it was originally white or black. Okay. It provides you, again, no information about the original pixel. It's just half white, half black in either case. If they truly flipped a coin, we have no information here. Okay, so this is actually kind of fun. Um, I got a little uh, applet so you can play around with it and actually slide these things around and screen and create your own and, um, other uh, images. So here's, uh, here's Alice's share, here's Bob's share. When we put these two together, what are we going to see? <laughs> yeah, of course. Okay, so it's kind of kind of neat that you can that you can actually do this. All right. Uh, okay, so they call this visual cryptography, but you know, uh, I guess you can think of it as a form of cryptography. It's probably more closely related to the secret sharing stuff we just talked about. But if you think of it in terms of cryptography, um, how does it compare? Okay, well, what's the key here in this thing? You could say there's no key, right? I mean, what's the key? Or you could say the key is. It's how you flip the coin, right? Really, which of those do you choose in each case? Okay, which option do you choose? And if you think of it that way, it's really kind of like a one-time pad, right? You're choosing this key and you're using it once and you construct this thing and that's it. Next time you want to construct an image, you start over. Basically generate the key as you go. So, I mean, thinking like the one-time pad, I mean, you really cannot do an exhaustive key switch. There's just no option to do that. Um, you can generate any image, right? By choosing black and white pixels appropriately. It doesn't have to be an image. You can do that with, it, with, with any file and have Alice yeah. and Bob uh, collectively sh share a file which is effectively encrypted with a one time. Um, yeah, I mean, to sort of do the analogy of this with a general file, you need a little bit more than zeros and ones, right? Because we get the gray, right? So. Um, yeah, have to think about that. But you could you could certainly do this more generally. In fact, um, there are schemes that use color images. There are schemes that do more than two choices, right? Get a little bit better. What what ends up happening is you can do more general secret sharing kind of things. Two out of three, three out of four, those kind of things. But the resolution tends to go down. The contrast is reduced. You do it with any file. It's, is it sort of like you decompress? You get a two-bit output, which for each one bit of the input. Yeah, you could do something like that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think about that. That's cute. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically there's no, no such thing as an exhaustive key switch here. Again, you can sort of think of the analogy to the one-time pad. Uh, what else do you want to say? Yeah, so um, you could say that visual cryptography is information theoretically secure meaning there's no shortcut attack. There's nothing you can do here to really help you attack this thing, okay? There really isn't an attack, okay, in the usual sense. Uh, when we think of the other crypto <coughs> algorithms we talked about, with the possible exception of the one-time pad, we don't get that kind of level of security. The best we can really say is that attacks are computationally infeasible. Okay, it's just too much work to do an exhaustive search to recover a 128-bit AES key or to you know, factor this uh, modulus to break RSA. But hey, you know, if somebody you know, comes up with a quantum computer that really actually works, maybe factoring will become easy and that will no longer be computationally feasible. Even if somebody comes up with a quantum computer, they're not going to break this visual cryptography. <laughs> it's a, in a different class of problems. All right.